I'd like to ask a question to begin our study for a little while this evening. We won't be dealing with anything that's new, but something that is very important. And it's simply this, do you have any influence? Do you have any influence? Now, I've spoken on this the other times, as many preachers have, and you've thought about it at times. But I get very put out, I guess is the word for it. Hearing people say they don't have any influence. Everybody has influence. It may be bad influence, or it may be good influence. But everybody influences somebody else for good or for bad. The life of each of us will have more bearing on people around us and in generations to come than all of the various monuments in stone or whatever that's been erected. Our lives are powerful. We may not think so, but our lives are powerful. How can we read what we read in the Bible and know it's the word of God written for us to enlighten us and not be reminded of how powerful one's own exemplary living is? So long after we're return to the dust, then we will have influence over people here. One reason there can't be a final judgment till the place of our influence is over and done with. There are many people influencing folks for good or for bad today that have long been dead on this earth. They do so in various ways. One way, of course, is through teaching. But no one is so poor and destitute, nor so, I guess we'd say, remote and withdrawn as to have no influence over anybody else whatsoever. We ought to point out and keep in mind clearly that somewhere eyes watch us and people follow our ways, whether good or bad. I'm reminded of a verse that actually came from an old soap opera many, many, many years ago. And it's this, there's a destiny which makes us brothers. None goes his way alone. The good we send into the lives of others comes back into our own. Well, if you'll think for a minute, you can think of a lot of them passages in the scriptures that talks about that kind of thing. But for those who spend time with the Bible, we recall many Bible accounts that reveal just how much influence we can have. Even when, and this is really who I'm speaking to tonight, when we think we're weak and poor and insignificant and don't amount to anything, uh, we're still having influence. And if we're godly, we have good influence. Going back to the Old Testament, you remember the little girl who was a captive in a foreign land of, of Assyria. She was a slave in a very important household. She was a slave to the captain of the Assyrian king's army. But the sad part about it is the captain was a leper and he had a terrible disease that could not be cured. Not among men. And yet this captive little maid so influenced that household and Naaman that when all was said and done, and he was cleansed by obeying what the prophet told him to do. And he says, now I know there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Didn't that a whole lot of intense learning and whatever, but just that little maid doing what she could where she was under duress. You can read that story, of course, in Second Kings, the fifth chapter, hope you will. And then, of course, say, well, I don't have any influence. I don't have any opportunities to exert good influence 
over others. But you see, she did. Then you continue in the Old Testament, coming to the 22nd chapter of First Kings, and we come across an eight-year-old boy. He was not heir to the throne to rule over God's people. And what was the state of God's people? Well, they were apostate. They were caught up in idolatry and all of its attendant evils and very wicked people. Well, what's interesting is that where older and more mature men had failed, Josiah instituted reforms which swept a nation and turned those people back to God. It was during his reign that idolatry was taken from the land and the book of the Lord was found again. Josiah had a great influence, made himself a great name, simply because he was willing to be used by the Lord. There's a key in everything we do, willing to be used by the Lord. Now think of this young man coming to the throne, and yet think of the young maiden earlier, two children, you might say, yet they used what they had where they were in service to the Lord. Then, of course, we're all mindful of how Esther put in the position she was in, found herself in a key position, and she was afraid but yet Mordecai, her uncle, said to her concerning her appeal to the king, her husband, to save the Jews, and remind her of her key position and to use it, said, and who knowest whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this, as to 414. We should all ask ourselves that question. A lot of things don't get done in our lives to influence other people for good, to teach them the truth, because we're always looking for something spectacular to do. And because it doesn't happen that way, we think we have no influence for good over anybody. But then we come to the New Testament, we come across another young lad. He was out with a crowd of people. And it came time for them to eat. Nobody had any food. They had heard a marvelous, wonderful sermon from Jesus, but the people were actually hungry. And all he had was five barley loaves and two fish. And yet out of that, our Lord fed 5,000 people. I'm quite sure that young fella didn't think he was all that significant. When something is used for the Lord and by the Lord, it ceases to be insignificant. And you know that lad's influence lives on. And so we still preach it and teach it. And I don't know who he is. Nobody else does. But he doesn't go unnoticed. And eternity alone will be able to disclose what our influence and that of this unknown young person has been. Then, of course, there's always somebody wishing for more money. Somebody saying, well, I'm poor, and I'm needy. I find that hard to understand among most Americans. Now, I've seen poverty in other parts of the world, and I know people have been in poverty in America, and some are now. But I don't know that I've ever been around many people who is as poverty stricken as the woman I'm about to talk about, whose account of whom is found in the New Testament. When you say poverty stricken, this widow was. But she was a Jew and faithful, and she went up to the temple to worship her God. And she had so very little to give. She had what's called two mites, far less than a than uh, one cent would be worth today, far less. Now, what's interesting is the Lord sitting over there watching people put their money in the treasury. 
I don't know who all he saw, but he saw no doubt a lot of folks put a whole lot more money in the treasury than that. Well, why does inspiration pick her and teach us such a lesson on good influence? Well, you can see, and you want to look to Luke 21, and I didn't mention it a while ago that the count of the young boy is found in Mark 6, but it is. And so she cast in her two mites, and that got the attention of our Lord. And he taught a lesson on that, as he often did, about her great liberality. And he taught it to those closest to him, his own apostle. And you know, it's recorded for all generations. And Jesus said, she cast in all that she had, even all her living. Now, you may have seen people like this, but I never have. And I've known some mighty good folks and members of the church. But I've never seen anybody in that state. Isn't it interesting that the Lord chose her? And she influences us to this day. It's to the Lord's attitude toward giving. Not only was her influence over the apostles made clear, but here's the thing, even as we do now, her influence is exerted wherever the word of God is read today. Now, does anyone still contend that they're too poor to have any influence for good for the Lord? are not enough that they can give. You know, if we actually didn't have a penny to our name as we are living right now where we are, I imagine we could scratch up enough stuff in the house to go take it down and sell it to give far more than this woman gave on other, in our contribution on the first day of the week. So it all comes down to state of mind, dedication, faith in God, Determination to follow his will and put him first. Well, of course, there was a, another woman who came into where Christ was sitting. And she opened a box of precious ointment. She anointed the Lord. And then one of his own disciples criticized her because it was a waste of something expensive that could have been sold, the money taken and given to the poor. But, you know, you just don't always have the Lord in the flesh in your living room teaching. But as the Lord said, you always have the poor with you. The point he was making is, you don't always have me here as I am now. And when I leave, I'll never be back on this earth again like I was and am at that time, if you want to speak in the, as if that time was the present tense. But then he said, the poor you have with you always. Then he went ahead and said, Matthew 26, wherever the gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial to her. Matthew 26, 6 through 13. And I guess you can say, and doing it right now, that's part of the prophecy of our Lord fulfilled. Influential? Well, as long as the world stands, that woman's influence is going to live, and look what kind of influence it is. We need to see that every poor person can do what they can and know the Lord doesn't expect of them what they cannot do. So whether you're rich or poor, whatever you want to think about that, you can exercise your influence for good. We also have the account in the New Testament of somebody we might call the bad Samaritan. We always talk about the good Samaritan. But that was the woman at the well, Jacob's well, Sychar. She came through their discussions and so forth to believe that Jesus was the Christ. And she left the drudgery of her water pot, which was the lot of women to do as she was doing. Ran all the way back home, ran down Main Street, you might say, crying out, look what I found. I've often wondered what people thought about her when they saw her and heard her doing what she was doing. 
If you read John chapter four, after the people listened to her, they went over and listened to Jesus, and here's what they said. Now we believe, not because of thy saying, the woman, but we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. But it's because of that woman's influence that they heard and believed. And she had quite a past. You look back to that discussion. She's kind of an unsavory character. But it shows she, even she was influenced by the Lord. Every time I hear some preacher mentioned as having little influence, I think of young Andrew. Don't hear a lot about him because there's not much said about him when it comes to the spread of the gospel. In fact, he's mentioned by name after the church was established. In fact, he's not even mentioned by name after the church is established. John 1, 41 through 42. We read this, though. He first found his own brother, Simon. He brought him to Jesus. Well, can you be an Andrew? Well, I think we all can do something like that. His influence was great. You know, I've often thought about Peter, the way we find him. Why would he listen to Andrew? Why would he listen to little brother Andrew? That says something about Andrew's influence over his older brother Peter, that he listened. We'll close the lesson simply by saying, do not sell yourself short on the influence that you exert over others. Just make sure you're living like the Bible said. Doing your best, submit yourself to everything the Bible teaches. And you'll be what you ought to be, but especially to your family, to your neighbors, all around. It doesn't take a genius or a big college education to be able to embrace these things. But it does take a determination to have an honest and good heart to read and understand and accept the truth as it is in the New Testament. So I hope these things help us as we exert our influence for good in the world. Thank you.